persons of respect to late Dr. Lal Bahadur Shastri ji, I request the dignitaries to light the lamp and pay floral tributes to this illuminous son of India. Thank you. I now request Thank you. I now request our director, Dr. Ravinder Kaur, to kindly welcome Dr. Manju Sharma, chairperson of today's function with a bouquet of flowers.
once again request our director ma'am to welcome professor sudhir kumar sofri speaker of today's function with a bouquet of flowers i request dr dr rk jain dean and joint director education to welcome dr ravinder kaur director indian agriculture research institute with a bouquet of flowers professor deepak pandal and shri divakar shastri ji grandson and mrs neera shastri daughter in law of late shri lal bahadur shastri thank you i now invite dr ravinder kaur director iarl to formally welcome and appraise the audience of the significance of the topic lal bahadur shastri memorial lecture very good evening to all of you dignitaries <coughs> on the dais and off the dais chair persons of today's function dr mrs manju sharma ji former secretary dbt government of india the distinguished speaker of the 45th lal bahadur shastri memorial lecture professor s k sapori ji vice chancellor jawaharlal nehru university new delhi members of the family of late shri lal bahadur shastri ji professor deepak painter ji director cgm cp and also former vc delhi university uh, professor arya kumar director lal bahadur shastri institute of management new delhi members of the board of management and academic council of the institute <coughs> deputy director generals of icr former directors of iari directors of the various icr institutes on the pusa campus my colleague dr jain dean and joint director education joint directors project directors heads of the uh, divisions professors of various disciplines faculty members of the post graduate school press and media invited guests scientists staff students ladies and gentlemen and Dr. Sahab, also I am um, sorry I missed your name. I my apologies if I have missed any uh, anybody's name. I welcome one and all of you on this very August evening. This series of annual lectures was instituted by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in 1968 as a mark of our respect to one of the most illustrious and exemplary sons and the. second prime minister of the independent india late shri lal bahadur shastri ji who died in harness while bargaining for peace and tranquility on the borders between the india and the pakistan shastri ji symbolizes the very simplicity of indian life in a vast cultural milieu and the triumph of a sovereign nation striving to meet the aspirations of its people he is the epitome of our national pride he invoked the reverential slogan jai jawan jai kisan honor the soldier honor the farmer because he realized that both the jawan guarding our frontiers and the kisan in the agricultural field helping to ensure food security to the countrymen are fundamental to sustaining uh, to sustain as an independent sovereign nation <laughs> The prestigious Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Annual Lectures have been in past delivered by Dr. G. V. K. Rao, Professor D. T. Lakravala, Professor C. H. Hanuman Tharao, Professor M. S. Swami Nathan, Shri Jayanti Patil, Professor Y. K. Alag, and Dr. D. N. Tiwari. The first lecture in 1968 was by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai on the topic. how green is our revolution the other prominent speakers include dr b siva raman dr kurian shri v shankar dr r w cummings dr m g k menon 
डॉक्टर आर ए मार्श लेकर डॉक्टर जी पद्मनाभन डॉक्टर मोन्टेक सिंह अलूवालिया डॉक्टर जी माधवन नायर डॉक्टर एम वी राव डॉक्टर दीपक कैंजल हिमसेल्फ इज अगेन हेयर विद अस टूडे डॉक्टर मंगला राय डॉक्टर एम सी सक्सेना डॉक्टर एम के भान एंड डॉक्टर के विजय राघव दीज लेक्चर्स डिलीवर्ड अर्लियर आर अ वेरिटेबल माइंड ऑफ विजडम एंड इंफॉर्मेशन इमेजिंग फ्रॉम सम ऑफ द बेस्ट ऑफ द ब्रेन्स इन द कंट्री एंड अप्रॉड before i introduce dr mrs manju sharma ji uh, on behalf of the institute and all those present here i welcome dr mrs manju sharma and prof, uh, uh, with a bouquet of flowers which i have already done so i have not repeated and extremely sorry for repeating those words and i also sincerely thank you madam for your august presence we feel honored also to welcome professor as ke sapori ji who is the speaker of our today's lecture series and on this august evening i would also i'm i feel very fortunate to also welcome mrs neera shastri ji the daughter in law of late shri uh, lal bahadur shastri ji and uh, the grandson of shri lal bahadur shastri ji shri vibhakar shastri ji uh, on this august evening welcome welcome once again we we are very very grateful to you for your spending your valuable time for this evening now it's my uh, very humble duty to present before you the chairperson of our today's evening uh, padma bhushan dr mrs manju sharma ji dr mrs manju sharma is a distinguished biologist nationally and internationally recognized for her monumental contributions in promotion of science and technology in particular the emerging field of biotechnology with her vision dedication and sustained efforts she is largely responsible for the rapid progress of biotechnology research application and commercialization in the country she has played a pivotal role in taking up the cause of women in science and application of science and technology for the benefit of women disadvantages people in rural areas She obtained a first class MSc from Lucknow University in 1961 and received the Birbal Sahni Memorial Gold Medal as well. Her well known research on the spheroids in organs other than leaves like stem and floral parts brought out for the first time the taxonomic and phylogenetic significance of spheroids. Her post doctoral research at Purdue University USA on latex bearing plants led to the understanding that ethyl can stimulate the yield of latex and rubber by 100%. This found direct commercial application in rubber plantations in Malaysia. From 1974 onwards with her presence in the government on various positions, she, she initiated and promoted many successful programs in a range of areas of science. Her unique contribution is in establishing a number of new institutions covering diverse fields of biotechnology she is a fellow of the third world academy of sciences national academy of agriculture sciences and national academy of sciences india of which she was also the president she was the general president of the indian science congress association in 1998 president of the association of microbiologists of india and president of vigyan parishad priyag she is a recipient of large number of awards and honors to name a few the waswick award in 1994 the norman bono award in 1995 gm modi science award in 2002 shri om prakash vasin award bp pal medal special distinction medal science, uh, science congress delhi ratan in 2003 jawaharlal nehru national award in 2000 by mp government vigyan gaurav from government of uttar pradesh and lifetime achievement award from biospectrum in 2004 she has also been conferred with fellowship of indian science writers association in 2000 and chosen member of hall of fame she on 6th october 2006 received from the prime minister of india nasis platinum jubilee gold medal for her lifetime contributions for the growth of the academy her contributions during her tenure as secretary department of biotechnology have been instrumental in shaping biotechnology research and application 
and giving it a very strong position in the national interest. After superannuating and completing her tenure as Secretary Department of Biotechnology in February 2004, she was appointed advisor to the Minister of Science and Technology against faculty at, and against faculty at IIT Delhi. She was given in 2007 the National Senior Woman Bioscientist Award. She has been given in 2007 Padma Bhushan by Government of India. Dr. Manju Sharma has left her mark as a researcher, science promoter and manager in all the areas she has dealt with and the positions she has occupied. Even after superannuation, she is devoting all her time through professional organizations and academies for spreading the message of science, especially for the young students, scientists, and in particular for women who regard her as a role model. She has made very valuable and laudable contributions towards national development through her dedication, very hard work, sustained efforts, far-sighted vision and commitment of science and technology and its application for human welfare. <coughs> Madam, we are very, very inspired by your very, very beautiful profile. And we are very grateful for you to spare your valuable time and to be with us this evening. With this, Madam, I would like to request you to uh, kindly introduce the speaker of the day for us today. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. to all the very, very distinguished guests here, respected Meera Shastri Ji, uh, Devakar Shastri Ji, Mr. Sudhir Sakuri, uh, Dr. Ravindra Kumar, and Dr. Jain, all the uh, distinguished scientists of ICR and other institutions, young students. It's really my privilege and I'm really very, very happy to come here and uh, chair this lecture, Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture, because of my real respect and affection for Shastri Ji. I was very young when he died, but uh, my brother had an occasion to work with him, under him, and uh, we knew him very, very personally, a remarkable human being who said, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, and, Jai, uh, and particularly his whole interest in the lives of the people, the poor people. That was what Shastriji was. We admired him, we respected him for that, and even today, when we want to talk about him, you know, we are full, our hearts are full of respect, affection and admiration for this great man. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ravindra Kumar has said uh, that very eminent speakers have given uh, this lecture. Uh, first of all, ma'am, thank you very much for those kind words and uh, I'm really very, very grateful to you. And amongst the eminent speakers, uh, we have another luminary Professor Sudhir Sopri, who is personally known to me for many, many years, more than 20 years. I can say that, you know, when we talk about nurturing and mentoring a young boy, a young student, a young scientist, Sudhir is one of them whom I mentored, nurtured, and I today see him as Vice Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University. It's really my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, for the benefit of the young students, let me formally uh, read out some of the salient features of his biodata, which is too long and it will take all the time if I start telling you all about his achievements. Uh, he is a very, very distinguished scientist, nationally and internationally known. His education in the JNK University and then his doctorate in the University of Delhi in the field of biology. 
He is a very eminent plant molecular biologist. His academic career in the year 1973 as a faculty at the School of Life Sciences, JNU. Uh, he began that and then his teaching and research career span over 40 years as visiting scientist, as a professor, as a director of various things, as coordinator of so many very research programs of this country. In fact, Sudhir Sapori is a household name amongst the plant molecular biologists, not only the senior scientists, but also amongst the students. <coughs> Professor Sapori has been awarded many national and international awards for his pioneering contributions to scientific research and training. Notable among them are Padma Shri, Government of India gave him for his outstanding career and his work. <laughs> the most prestigious Bhatnagar Award of CSIR, which is considered as the Nobel Prize of India for the young people. Chakravarti Award, Birvasani Medal of the Botanical Society, Birvasani Birth Centenary Award, etc., etc. I can go on reading this. He's an elected fellow of all the academies of this country, as well as the Third World Academy of Sciences. Professor Sapori received his honorary doctorate from Paralas Hindu University and from Rani Durgavati University, Jabalpur. He has more than 220 research publications in referred journals and with high impact factor, 13 edited books and over 50 chapters in the different books. Professor Sapori is one of the most outstanding scientists and a teacher of this country and above all a par excellent human being, gentle, soft spoken and one of those teachers and a leader who is loved, respected and admired by the younger ones for his great contributions and by all the senior scientific community of this country. I have great privilege to introduce him today to all of you and it has been always, uh, many times it has happened that I have introduced Sudhi. So it's not the first time, but every time when I speak about him, it's really from the heart I speak and it's only on a very, very personal basis I always say that I respect you Sudhi, I admire you and I'm very fond of you. So Professor Sudhi support. Dr. Manju Sharmaji, thanks for your kind words. As always, I think you have been very supportive for all what we have been doing for a number of years. Members of the Shastri family, I'm really uh, nice to see you here. Uh, Professor Deepak Pentel, Dr. Ravinder Kaur, Dr. R. K. Jain, Professor Mehta, I see I'm meeting him after a long time. Uh, all the esteemed faculty of uh, IRI and ICR and uh, dear students. It's a great honor and privilege for me to deliver a Shastri Memorial Lecture. Everybody knows about the contributions of this person, Shastri Ji, coming from a very humble background. He rose to become the Prime Minister of this country and gave this slogan which everybody now remembers. If you tell somebody this slogan, they relate it to Shastri Ji. And that showed the concern he had for the country, uh, the defense of the country, and the other defense of the country, which is really the agriculture productivity. That is an inner defense against which we have to really fight. So it's a great honor for me to deliver this uh, uh, lecture. This lecture may be a little bit more technical, but I will try to see that uh, the message of the talk uh, is uh, conveyed to the uh, Now, these are the challenges uh, which face us. Uh, everybody in this audience would know it. They would have reflected on these uh, in many different forms. That is, we are talking about food security and nutritional security. And this is what uh, Shastriji also stood for. 
Food security is becoming more and more important because of rise in population. And what is shown here is that uh, the population of some of the states in this country is much larger than the population of many countries uh, around the world. While that's a major concern, the other thing is the nutritional security. So both these become very, very important things uh, for this country. And our challenge is how to meet both the requirements, the food requirement and the nutritional requirement. of decades in order to meet these challenges. And I think we are really proud of what has been done in IRI and the ICI institutes. But before I go to that, what we have to make sure that uh, it is not only the productivity which is very important, which of course it is the people who are working in the laboratory trying to create new varieties uh, with more yield or less losses, but how to take whatever the productivity is here, up to the table. How does it reach uh, the person who has to really get it? And there are a lot of other factors which come into play here, which is economics part of it, uh, public private sector organizations, uh, storage problems, food processing, marketing, uh, other issues which come up into this. So it's not, not only how much you produce, but how does this reach the person who is really, uh, who wants this one? I'm not an expert in this area, but many people in our university are, and I keep discussing with them, their economists, their other uh, people who are there. But I will uh, restrict myself to this domain, which is our domain, uh, how do we work in laboratory and create new varieties. Now this is what has been done by studying about many different agriculture scientists. We met with the Green Revolution. As was mentioned, that one of the talk which was given, how green is the green revolution? I always feel it is very green. You know, I think we really saved us from those PL authority schemes. And uh, Swaminath and Norman Bollard, I think, uh, together this uh, do, along with many other scientists in this country, brought about uh, green uh, revolution. We call it uh, the first development, the first revolution. This uh, later was followed by the second development, the second revolution, which we call the development of the hybrid seeds. This technology has been very well standardized in many crop plants in uh, China, in many other countries, and also in India. The third development which is now taking place uh, is what we call the development of the biotech crops using the new technologies, the genome technology, the genetic engineering technologies in order to develop new biotech crops. And the only biotech crop that so far has been uh, allowed to be grown in this country allowed to be grown in this country is the BT cotton, and which many people say that has really helped in order to boost our exports and help the farmers. Now, biotechnologies, there are two ways, ways by which you can uh, achieve improved traits. One is what we call as a marker-assisted breeding. You have to identify a specific <coughs> gene which is associated with a specific phenotypic or genotypic marker. And IRI again was one of the first who started, Dr. Prabhu is here sitting, I think, his lab and many others who got into uh, developing this marking, assisting breeding, and some varieties were developed using this technology. The other technology is what we call the genetic engineering technology, which has been used in the United States and many other countries in order to develop some new traits which are there. The BT cotton is one of the genetic engineering technology through which that trait was developed. And the basic uh, things which we are talking about, ex uh, besides the traits which have been developed, is that we can also use these technologies to develop traits of plants which can be grown under stress conditions. So that is the basic thing which we are talking about. Now in order to do that, the technology requires that we know we have to identify the right kind of a gene or the genes. The genes are the ones which are basically regulating different phenotypes, different functions. So once we have identified the right genes, there are methodologies known by which this gene can be transferred into the recipient plant and you can develop an alternate trait. That, that's basically genetic engineering stands for. And this is the most difficult part. And this is the most difficult part. How to identify the right gene for the traits, or many genes with similar traits. And this problem will 
be much more enhanced in future the development of stress adapted plants because in future the agriculture will have to deal with uh, less of water less of energy and less of land and therefore we'll be seeing more dry lands high saline soils high co2 high temperature these are what we call it the climate changes which are occurring around the world therefore the agriculture will have to deal with these issues in future And this is the real scenario, uh, which is uh, in this country, at least two of these traits, salinity and drought, which are there, they are two serious threats to agriculture yield. And as is mentioned here in India, uh, this was uh, the data. Which was given, 50% uh, is threatened with salinity, 80% close to drought conditions in many cases. So we'll have to deal with agriculture where you have to grow plants under these uh, stress conditions. And that's what I was saying, whether new technology would be useful for this purpose. So the questions which we have been asking uh, in our laboratory, would it be possible through biotech assisted uh, crop breeding to impart novel adaptive behavior in crop plants for growth under salinity and drought conditions or other abiotic state conditions? This is a broader questions which many people are struggling to answer and to achieve these targets. I was earlier working at ICGB, uh, first at JNU, then at ICGB, back to JNU. So I've been traveling from one institute to other. But the basic interest in the science has remained more or less similar. To understand uh, the physiological and molecular basis of stress tolerance, how do, crop plant, how do plants tolerate? Can we develop stress tolerant plants via genetic engineering technology? So this is the two issues which we are dealing with. So what we are basically doing is to get into the mode of gene discovery because it's finally the genes which will be controlling different characters. And there are many ways to discover these genes. Uh, you have either go through forward genetics or reverse genetics approaches. Forward genetics or reverse genetics approaches. And once uh, these genes are discovered and their function has been identified, you can use this to genetic modification techniques to go into for crop improvement programs. So the basic thing how to identify these genes, as is known to most of you here now, that a lot of uh, plants have now been sequenced, the full genome sequences have been done. India was uh, involved in sequencing of the rice part of the rice genome, one of the chromosome of the rice genome, thanks to Dr. Manu Sharmaji. I think she really initiated this program in Department of Biotechnology and pushed it. And later on, also, uh, they taken up the work on tomato genomes. Again, India participated in this program and this tomato genome, one of the uh, chromosome was also sequenced. So India has been participating in these major genomic projects. And currently, if you see so many plants whose genomes have been sequenced, uh, this is huge data, what we call as the big data. How do you really uh, decipher which gene is doing what function? At our lab, what we have been doing is to isolate these genes from some tolerant species, which are naturally tolerant, or you make a comparison between susceptible and tolerant varieties and see why some tolerants are tolerant. Or you induce a species, uh, a specific plant, under stress conditions. And we do different technologies. I don't want to get into details of this because these are all known to most of the scientists who are sitting here. So there are various mechanisms, ways, uh, technologies by which genes can be identified. And the function of the gene can be tested, whether this gene can give you specific trait or it cannot give a specific trait. Now while doing these all uh, experiments in uh, ICGB, we are able to uh, isolate or create a large database of stress regulated genes. This was something like to the tune of 8,000 to 10,000 genes which we discovered. But this is not functionally validated they, because they were differentially regulated so on and so forth. But out of these so many genes, we found that at least four new different pathways were discovered in our the laboratory. One is called the glaxless pathway, the other is the helicacif pathway, the G proteins and uh, totally new pathway which was never known into the any plant systems called the CBS domain containing proteins. You don't have to remember all that, but uh, that new pathways were discovered which have some relevance to stress adaptation in the plant systems. I will go quickly through this pathway, glaxless pathway. Uh, in which we have been working for the last 20 years. 
Now, what is this pathway? This pathway was discovered in the year 19 and 13, and a lot of work in this pathway has been done in animal systems. This pathway was known in animal systems, in other systems. And uh, if you see here, hardly any report of plant systems was there. You know, most of the work was in this pathway was being done in animal systems. Now, how did I get into this? Why did I work on this pathway? Because it was known in the animal systems, so why should I get interested in this? This was because uh, one of my students uh, was working in cancer biology program in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Then, introduced me to a book by Albert St. George, who is a Nobel laureate. And uh, this book was called Electronic Theory of Cancer. And this theory was that uh, there is a compound called methylglyxin, which is also known as retin. And uh, this is one which controls cell proliferation in cancer tissues. And uh, this toxic compound has to be detoxified by these enzymes called glyoxylases. Now, why this interested me? Because I was also working in plant tissue culture that time. Many of you were working. So I thought tissue culture, where you grow this kind of callous masses, look something like a cancer system. You know. So whether under the same conditions, the same pathway of glyoxylase, these enzymes and Mg would work also in the plant systems. And that was the beginning where we started on this. And this is the toxic compound which is produced in the animal plant, any systems by different pathways, and then detoxified by these two enzymes called glyoxylase 1 and glyoxylase 1. For the understanding of this talk, you have to only remember three words and that is methylglyxyl, gly1, gly2. Very easy to remember. This is a toxic compound which should not be accumulated in the body systems, whether it's a humans or animal systems. It has to be detoxified. Other it was, otherwise, it causes diseases in the humans. Uh, and therefore, for detoxification, these two enzymes are required. And this is what we did. We had uh, isolated this glyoxylase from plant system glyxylase 1 and glyxylase 2 and we showed that if we make more of this protein in the plant systems as is shown here so these are the plants these are tobacco plants they call it transgenic tobacco plants if you make more of these two proteins in these plants then these plants can be grown under stress condition now where our basic question initially was whether we can grow plant under stress condition high stress <coughs> conditions and these are the plants which are grown under 200 millimolar saline conditions, sodium chloride conditions. So it's a high salinity, but uh, overexpression of these two proteins allows it to grow under saline conditions. That was sometimes back which we found out. So this was for the first time that correlation of this pathway with stress adaptation in the plants was being shown. And we went in to see the mechanisms of this, why, how this is happening. And we found that uh, when you have more expression of these two proteins, the level of this toxic compound really goes down. There is a relationship, this uh, glutathione uh, function is there, its uh, ratio is much more. Antioxidant and uh, enzymes also go up and also phytogelatin because we had earlier shown, later shown that once this pathway is regulated, uh, stress tolerance for salinity drought as well as heavy metal stress. So very simple message, glyxylase pathway when manipulated in plant systems can lead to those plants tolerating high stress conditions. Now, whether this is possible to do it in crop plants, that was the basic question. So this was done, these uh, two uh, genes of Gly1 and Gly2 were then transformed into the rice which is a crop plant. And what was found that uh, if these plants which are making more of these two proteins, even the rice was able to grow under high saline conditions. And in fact, these experiments were done in Karnal, the Saline Solidity Research Institute. We also found that if these plants are grown under drought conditions, that means if you don't give water to these plants for 16 days, then these plants can still survive. And if you rewater these plants, they are growing well and also produce the panicles and the seeds. So manipulation of this pathway, which was shown earlier in a model plant like tobacco, we are showing that if you do it also in the crop plant, they are able to tolerate stress content. 
We are getting into more details to check upon the molecular mechanisms, uh, looking into the microarray proteomics. But we did one experiment I will show you of the proteomics. Proteomics made total protein content of these uh, transgenic plants was analyzed and we found changes in large number of proteins. But one of the protein which attracted my attention was this triphosphate isomerase. This level of this protein was higher in the transgenic plants. In those transgenic plants which were producing more of those two enzymes, glyxylase 1 and glyxylase 2. Now why was it important for us to check this particular protein, triphosphate isomerase? Because it was shown earlier in animal systems that this protein, triphosphate isomerase, is the one, if it is deficient, this was a mutant which was shown, which causes a neurodegenerative diseases. If this protein is defective, it can cause neurodegenerative diseases in human systems. And they had shown that uh, this uh, mutation was in this particular protein, TPI, triphosphate isomerase. And what it does, if it is deficient, it, the system produces more of dry hydroxy acetone phosphate which is the cause for the production of this toxic compound methylglyxal. Okay, so there will be more of methylglyxal production which cannot be then totally uh, detoxified and therefore you developed a lot of uh, diseases. So when we looked at this TPI, I found that uh, this particular protein even in plant systems was found to be regulated by the toxin itself. So toxin MG itself regulated the expression of this uh, enzyme TPI, both activity protein and gene expression level. Now what does it all mean to us? We found that MG affects the expression of this TPI. Is it that this toxin compound, it's a very strange thing, I think you should look at the toxin itself becomes a regulator. That's what I'm trying to convey. Toxics becomes a regulator. Now, if toxin becomes a regulator of one of the gene, the question was, is it only for one gene or more genes? And therefore, we looked at even the expression of these two, which are detoxifying enzymes. It also affects the expression of these. And we later on find by, found by microarray that, in fact, it disturbs a lot of gene expression within the system. So the model which was proposed and that's the image which probably I wish you to carry forward. It's not yet become a textbook knowledge, but it's uh, something at the level of research only. When the plants receive stress, whether it is draw stress, cold stress, and other stresses, our model is that this toxic compound goes up. And if toxicity goes up, the plant will die. And in the process of this going up, the level of this imported compound glutathione goes down. And this is a disturbance within. This disturbance within creates the condition of stress. And once this condition of stress is created, that is a sensor. We think that change of methylglyxal becomes a sensor for the plant. Plant feels that I'm now in trouble. So I must get rid of this toxic compound. So what it does, it affects this TPI in a negative fashion. This is if it is because it controls the regulation of MG, I was mentioning earlier. So on one hand, it will regulate the expression of this TPI so that MG level goes down. Simultaneously, it also induces the expression of these two enzymes, GLI1 and GLI2, which are required for detoxification. You see how sensitive the plants are. And they immediately send a signal that this toxic compound need not be accumulated within the system and start inducing the expression of other proteins and genes which are required for detoxification mechanisms. It looks all very interesting and simple, but what we found was that this is a little more complicated story. Because what we found, I was just mentioning here just earlier, that uh, till uh, the rice genome sequence was done, Everybody were thinking that we have one gene of glyxylase 1 and one gene of glyxylase 2. But when the whole genome sequences of rice was done, we found that there are at least 11 different uh, glyxylases 1 and three different glyxylases 2. Now, which of these is really regulating what? That is becoming more and more complicated on this. 
So then the laboratory what we decided that we'll look into the function of all of these. Instead of picking and selecting, we'll look into the function of all of these genes and started cloning, overexpressing, getting the proteins, looking at the activities. But in the process, what we found was that uh, when we looked at the evolutionary profile of these genes, we found that there are two different kinds of glyoxylases. One which is a zinc-dependent glyoxylase, which is the normal glyoxylase is present in all human beings, every system, and detoxifies uh, Mg. There is another one which we found in plant system was nickel-dependent. So this is interesting during evolution what has happened that this nickel dependent enzyme is normally present only in lower eukaryotes these bacterial systems here all these nickel dependent and it is present in the plant systems but if you look at the zinc dependent zinc dependent is present in mainly animals and fungi and others including plants so somewhere during the evolution plants have retained the bacterial kind of nickel enzyme whereas human beings have not retained the nickel one. There is no nickel dependent enzymes in the human system. So that's the, during evolution this has happened. The question before us was whether nickel dependent enzymes really are active enzymes or not. So I'm just not go again into details, but these are two papers we just came in plant journal. Uh, one where we show that uh, there is a nickel dependent activity in the plant systems, this has been uh, done in a very great detail. This work was done. Exactly which amino acids are involved in this uh, nickel functions have been done and also transgenic work with this uh, was done. The other very interesting report which we found in that is in glyoxylase 2 was a protein which never had glyoxylase 2 activity. This is a warning to all the students here sitting here. When you do homology base, just based on homology don't convince yourself that this is the same protein unless you have really tested the activity of that protein. And when we tested the activity of this glyoxylase 2, it didn't have any glyoxylase 2 activity. It had totally different activity. And the other glyoxylase 2 which we looked at, this again another paper which came in Plant Journal, is where we found that this was a glutathione response to glyoxylase 2. These two papers I'm just telling you that we are still working on it. You know, <laughs> This whole family is being worked out and we are finding new and new data in this uh, glyoxylase family. So basic conclusion then is that glyoxylase system, glyoxylase 1 and 2, the glyoxylase pathway has some role in plant stress adaptations. Which are the glyoxylases which are doing? We know some of them, the others are being discovered. But in the meantime, what people have done, they have used uh, the clones which we had prepared Gly 1 and Gly 2 and transformed into other plants. Rice, we had shown that it gives to stress adaptation. The work was shown, these clones were taken by a group in Chile, and they have also published this work. It works in tomato. They are also working in grapes, and another group is working in mustard. So this whole pathway is not very specific to one plant, but it can be used in manipulation of stress tolerance in other uh, crop plants also. Briefly then, what we are showing the development of glyoxylase research in plant system. As I mentioned in 1913, the whole research started uh, long back in animal systems. The first report in plants came in 1981, and this was in a, uh, by uh, Douglas for Needles, where they had just mentioned that there is a glyoxylase activity in the plants. And following that, if you see that most of the work which has come up in this particular pathway in plant system was from our laboratory. But lately, some other groups from China and Japan have also started contributing into this. And today the scenario is because we always felt that we are very lucky nobody else is working on it, so we always will have preference, you know, first uh, way to publish it. But things are getting more difficult because other groups are now coming into glyoxylase research. And this is another group in Japanese which have now modified their model. Uh, they were earlier restricted their model only to this part, but now they have added uh, glyoxylase also as one of the pathway to be looked at. And most of the work which has been done in proteomics, genomics work, is now showing that glyoxylase does change in response to various stresses. So the idea is there that pathway which was discovered here is now getting uh, further uh, confirmation from many different laboratories uh, around the world. 
and this is again uh, in soybean proteomics work uh, they are adding now I mean these are now being added in their models uh, this glyxlase one now this is where I started I was telling you that I was uh, working on tissue culture and this is from where we got uh, our initial uh, uh, leads that I must work into this pathway and uh, I was very happy to see a proteomics work which was done in uh, tissue culture callus work in uh, avocado embryos and they discovered glyxlase. So it's a whole circle for me. You know, it started from tissue culture, uh, we went into the glyxlase, did everything to stress adaptation and even for proliferation others, now people are finding, yes, glyxlase is probably playing a role uh, there also. Those who are more interested in this uh, pathway, I can uh, directly go to, after a long time I got uh, strength to write a review on this because so many other groups around the world started confirming what we had done. So we have now this uh, review which is on, uh, and we are saying that they could be considered as a biomarkers. Maybe many of people who are working in plant physiology may still be hesitant, but I said try for it because these uh, glyxlase 1, 2, and MG could be biomarkers for uh, stress in adaptation in plant systems. So this is uh, basically a big discovery which we had uh, last 20 years working on it, uh, the fundamentals of this, uh, we showed that uh, we can make use of manipulation of this pathway to develop uh, stress tolerance rice plants. And this has been transferred to a seed company, stuck it there for the time being till uh, we're allowed to do uh, testing in the field conditions. I think I will avoid because uh, gene pyramiding is another thing I will like to get rid of this. But what we are doing, uh, instead of only uh, basing all our data on uh, glyxlase, we are pyramiding uh, glyxlase along with uh, other genes uh, which are involved in sodium homeostasis, NHX and SOSWEN. And we have done this gene pyramiding experiments and now been able to de develop what we call as the triple transgenic plants. And these are marker-free plants. Now people had a lot of doubts about markers, these antibiotic markers. What we have developed is a marker-free transgenic rice which has three different genes in this, transferred in IR64 and CSR10, and they show good stress tolerance. And these are the plants, they're still in the greenhouse uh, uh, conditions. Okay, so, and this is one book which was published on stress adaptations. Uh, anybody can, more details on all signaling pathway, uh, gene expression profiles, everything has been uh, worked out in this uh, particular book. To end, to feed our population and reduce poverty, our greatest uh, global challenges uh, under the climate conditions uh, would remain uh, high productivity. And I feel that our future aim should be to develop plants that combine higher yields, reliable yield stability, better quality, and obvious characters resisting stresses, both abiotic and biotic, over years and locations. And if we have to consider GM technology, we should consider safe GM technology along with other methodologies to overcome all these uh, barriers. Thank you very much. affection and appreciation to Professor Sudhir Kumar Sopri, the very distinguished and eminent speaker of today's program. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude the program, I invite Dr. R.K. Jain, Dean and Joint Director Education to formally present the vote of thanks. Chairpersons of today's function, Dr. Manju Sharma, former Secretary DBT, Government of India, Professor Sapori, Vice Chancellor, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and Speaker of 
फोर्टी फिफ्थ लाल बहादुर शास्त्री मेमोरियल लेक्चर मेंबर ऑफ द फैमिली ऑफ श्री शास्त्री जी मैडम डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर रविंद्र कौर प्रोफेसर दीपक पेंटल फॉर्मर वाइस चांसलर डेली यूनिवर्सिटी प्रोफेसर मेहता प्रोफेसर फॉर्मर वाइस चांसलर होम उदयपुर डिस्टिंग डिग्नेटरीज इन्वाइटेड गेस्ट प्रेजेंट इन द हॉल members of board of the management and academic council iri officials joint directors project directors my dear distinguished colleagues representatives from the press staff and student of this deemed university it's my honor and pleasure to propose the formal vote of thanks at the end of this successful conclusion of the most prestigious 45th lal bahadur shastri memorial lecture organized today by the indian agricultural research institute besides the father of nation shri mahatma gandhi ji shri shastri ji is another individual who symbolizes the dreams the desires the ambitions the aspirations of the most ordinary man i on behalf of this institute pay my humble tribute and respect to the memory of this great son of india who sacrificed his life for this country on behalf of the director faculty staff and students on on my own behalf i would like to thank dr manju sharma for kindly accepting our invitation to chair this prestigious lecture we feel honored and inspired with your presence and for chairing this event i can only assure you IRI will certainly produce more of BP Pals and more of Swami Nathans. I wish to convey my gratitude and sincere thanks to Professor Sapori for kindly accepting our invitation to deliver this prestigious lecture and joining us in paying our tribute to the memory of Sri Lest Shastri Ji. Your so lecture has been a brilliant exposition, and the take-home message is. i would say the two genes the gly1 and the gly2 perhaps these two genes would certainly help us in improving our crop improvement program for abiotic stress members of the family of sri lal bahadur shastri ji have built and nurtured a very special and intimate relationship with this institute and icr on behalf of this institute i would like to record our sincere thanks to them for their affectionate presence actually i'm also thankful to the director dr ravindra kaur for providing administrative and logistic support otherwise it would have been difficult to organize this function so successfully i also record my sincere thanks and appreciation for all the invited guests to responding to our invitation and for their gracious presence i express my sincere thanks to the directors of our sister institutes joint directors present project directors and my dear distinguished colleagues for attending this prestigious lecture i extend thanks to the representative members from the press the media and the doordarshan for responding to our invitation and covering this prestigious lecture gratefully acknowledged is also on record here for the services given by some of my colleagues in the faculty staff of the post graduate school the students the volunteers and the technical administrative and supporting staff from the directorate different divisions and this auditorium for their valuable dedicated contribution behind the scene for successful organizing this function i thank you all once again and invite you for a cup of tea thank you so much <laughs>